Thank you. Thanks, Joe. So, thank you all for coming. <coughs> Thanks for inviting me. Um, when I was talking about Gideon, or talking with Gideon about what to present, um, we kind of thought that a mixture of me talking at you and then me demoing something would be interesting. So it's not just, you know, 450 slides, it's only 300 slides <laughs> and uh, a little bit of something to break it up. So what I'd like to do is present, um, basically talk to you about a little bit about who we are, but mainly about some of the products that we have coming out um, and talk to you about why deep learning or um, deep neural networks in particular are really taking off and what is the connection with GPUs. And uh, so hopefully you'll get something interesting out of that. And then at the end, so that'll be maybe 30 minutes. And then at the end of that, for 10 or 15 minutes, what I thought I would do is demonstrate a relatively easy, I think, easy to use tool that we have called Digits. And so Digits is a um, kind of a front end to um, deep learning frameworks. It's a graphical front end, so it's pretty easy to use. It makes for good demos. And hopefully you'll find it interesting. And if you're, if you're at a point where you're kind of um, looking for a relatively easy on-ramp for um, learning about or perhaps even deploying uh, convolutional neural networks, especially image classification networks, um, using these techniques, then I think you'll find the digits demo to be um, very applicable and something that you might want to explore. So hopefully it might be useful as well, um, not just eye candy. So, uh, sorry about that, need to wake my laptop up again. Just by way of background, um, I've been at NVIDIA for quite a while. I've had uh, a couple different roles. My current role is uh, what we call a solutions architect, and a solutions architect at NVIDIA is a technical resource in sales. They're generally fairly broad, so we're kind of jack of all trades, master of none, and that's true for me. Um, I did my master's work on neural networks in 89, and 89 was a kind of an interesting time for neural networks because they were, it looked like they were picking up steam and then it certainly felt like they lost steam shortly thereafter. Um, and as you all know, they've definitely picked up a lot of steam, especially in the last five years or so. So it's kind of gratifying for me because I actually know something about what this new, a little bit about what this new wave is. But nevertheless, I'm very much a generalist. So I do a lot of different things. Um, Specifically, I focus on OEMs, but I do a lot of different things for our OEMs basically to help them with the sales of GPU-enabled servers. So I do know something about machine learning. I do know something relatively basic things about neural networks and the applications for machine learning, but I bet you 50, 50 to 75 percent of you, maybe all of you, know a lot more than I do about various aspects of machine learning and deep neural networks. So there's going to be a limit to the level of questions that I can answer, but I'll do my best. I would encourage you to ask questions. Uh, ask it while it's, you know, while you've thought about it. Not don't hold it until later because you'll probably forget or um, it won't seem as relevant to you at that point. But just feel free to interrupt me as I go. So um, deep learning is really revolutionizing computing, and Nvidia is kind of internalizing this in. Um, really amazing ways that I necessarily can't, I can't necessarily go into, but um, two years ago our CEO said we really want to focus on deep learning and if you went to our GTC conference back then you would have witnessed that. Prior to that GTC really had a strong focus on high performance computing because that's where we were at with GPU computing. Um, we initiated GPU computing in the 2007 or 2008 time frame and our early focus was HPC, scientific computing, technical computing. And we've done, I think, a lot of good stuff in that domain with GPUs. But um, in 2014, we really recognized um, some trends that had begun and were visible to us as early as 2012. And we really decided to focus on deep learning as a technology that was going to differentiate us from where we were, as well as what a bunch of other folks were using accelerators for. So we're really focused on deep learning. And as you all know, deep learning can solve a really a wide variety of different problems. Um, but even if you go beyond sort of some of the obvious stuff like natural language processing, autonomous machines, whether they're robots or cars or what have you, drones, 
um, or any other application, you know, even basic image classification. It's, uh, it's fairly clear now, and I think it's going to become even more clear in the future, that it's literally going to revolutionize the way we program computers. So the, the, the age of procedural programming is something that's going to have a very significant and noticeable inflection point right around now. And it's as a result of the fact that we're going to go from essentially 100% procedural programming, which we've known for the last 50 years or so, to a new era where we're talking about a data plus model driven programming. And that's a big part of why deep learning is so interesting, so exciting, and why we're discovering that it can solve all these kinds of new problems because it's fundamentally a different approach. And it's, there's a lot of investment in this right now. So um, I'm not able to disclose publicly all the companies that are buying lots and lots of GPUs, but we are definitely working with TRI, Toyota Research Institute. They're very interested in what we're doing. We're very interested in what they're doing. Um, we have a lot going on in autonomous driving and smart cars. Uh, so we're getting to be a company that is really redefining itself and uh, shifting its focus to focusing on deep learning and, the, and this application of computing technology wherever it may be. And certainly automotive um, applications for this are abounding right now. There's a lot of investment and so we're focusing heavily on those spaces wherever they may be. So uh, I mentioned a little bit about this already. We've kind of had a, tr a traditional programming model that was largely procedural based, I would suggest. Not to say that there isn't, not to denigrate it or anything like that, but if you looked at computer vision, let's say up till about 2010 or so, it was driven by um, dozens and dozens of different methods that would be used to solve particular computer vision problems. Um, so, you know, problems that were based on flow or movement had a, a whole category of techniques. Problems that were based on simple recognition had a whole category of techniques. Other types of inferences problems had different techniques. Um, and if you look at the ImageNet competition, for example, as it went from 2010 to 2012 to 2014, you saw that. You saw that uh, you had, you know, dozens or hundreds of submissions where they were using a variety of different techniques, even though they were all kind of in the same, roughly speaking, in the same uh, accuracy range. Um, and what happened in 2012 and then t through 2014 and even now is um, essentially all of the researchers discovered that just used to use ImageNet as an example that really convolutional neural networks were significantly better than any of these literally dozens of techniques and variations of techniques that they had been using previously and competing with each other with previously. And so there was a strong shift and, and movement focus on convolutional neural networks which has now um, you know, sort of busted through a barrier and taken us from the 80 to 85 percent accuracy rate to the 95 plus percent range on ImageNet. Um, and that's basically the difference between what we see on the left hand side and what we see on the right hand side. And if we drill, if we were to drill into that in more detail, we would see a procedural, even when we're talking about those algorithms, we would see largely a procedural driven approach to something that is really not um, written or crafted the same way at all. We have to rethink how we are um, solving problems and how we're quote unquote writing code to solve problems. And we're basically using lots and lots of data plus a model to redefine the problem in this new domain. So specifically, what we've focused on, what NVIDIA has focused on, has been convolutional neural networks a lot because that's where um, the some of the early breakthroughs, and by early I mean like 2012 to 2014, but some of the breakthroughs there were evident to us in convolutional neural networks, which would typically be used for image classification and other types of image recognition problems. And these types of problems consist of basically two uh, activities, training the network, which is organizing the network so that it will actually perform the classification or recognition problem that you want it to do, and then the inference problem, which is actually using the network to do what it's designed to do, recognize or classify images in this case. This is really where all of the, um, not all, but almost all of the compute intensity is, is in the training side, and that's where GPUs got deployed first. And that's where, uh, if you're an ImageNet challenger, for example, this is really where the challenge is. Okay, this is just something you do to prove that the network's working or that, you know, this is the actual, the inference path is the actual way that you win when you're actually 
um, competing, but in order to win, you have to do a great job here. And so training a deep, uh, a deep neural network or a convolutional neural network is a very compute intensive problem. And one of the things that we recognize and other rec others have recognized for a long time now is for various kinds of models, this can be largely recast as a matrix matrix multiply. And if you want to see more detail on that, we actually have one of our um, guys who writes the library go through a more detailed treatment of this topic. How do you go from something which is basically a connection of weights? I mean, it shouldn't be too hard to see that there's something like that in there, but we can literally, with data organization, recast this as a matrix matrix multiply. In other words, the heavy lifting part of the training path can be recast as a matrix matrix multiply, and that is right in the sweet spot of what GPUs do. And this, it's a n cubed problem, which is what um, I would have guessed if, I, if someone had asked me that question about matrix inversion. Um, it's an order of n cubed problem, right? So matrix matrix multiply has a lot of compute intensity for the data, for per byte of data that you have to read or write. And so that's just, that is literally in the sweet spot of GPUs. People discovered this. Um, it was, you know, so beneficial that early on they wrote their own code to do um, this problem, if you will, with this matrix matrix multiply problem. Although they, not all of the researchers recognized it as such, and so the early attempts at writing GPU accelerated code certainly gave them interesting speed ups. But when we got involved, we wrote a library called QDNN, which is designed to do nothing, essentially nothing but this. Right? It's basically to facilitate this, make it run fast, and cast the data exactly in a way that the GPU will just chew through it like a wood chipper. So what happened was in the 2012 to 2014 time frame is that all this stuff basically came together, or at least we witnessed it on the NVIDIA side. We took note of the fact that there were new models that were really starting to prove themselves. We have the big data revolution's been going on for a long time, but you know the internet has basically been causing us to collect and aggregate data for literally decades now. And um, this aggregation and accumulation of data, whether you're talking about it on a daily basis, like Walmart, or if you're talking about it over a very long range of time, like pictures of cats on the internet, this aggregation of data is critical, uh, as we know, for deployment of these models for, at, for, for usefully and efficiently training a, a neural network to make it an effective tool, we need a huge amount of data. And then the third piece, at least from NVIDIA's perspective, is the GPU. When you put all these three together, you see this kind of really dramatic shift in the industry. Um, and uh, just as an example, like in the 2012 to 2014 time frame, you had just a few researchers out of literally 100 or more in the ImageNet competition that were using GPUs. By 2015, it was like all but three that were using GPUs, and we have basically um, cleaned up in that space. So there's lots and lots of people who have acknowledged, including like one of our big competitors in the space, Intel, has acknowledged that really a lot of people are associating training of neural networks with GPUs because they do such a good job at it. And there's really been a lot of development in this space. So um, I guess I should add, uh, what's the new one from OpenAI? Um, something Jim, forget what they call it, but I think they just announced it today. So there's a, this is you know we've got more and more frameworks and more and more uh, mechanisms and uh, hardware and software mechanisms being built to do this job. The Facebook Big Sur, the design that they released for this is basically a server that they're going to basically make a commodity or at scale server that they're going to use for this problem, and it's designed to handle eight GPUs. That's kind of the distinguishing characteristic of that server is that they're packing as many GPUs as they possibly can into the densest space in order to make um, their compute intensity as high as possible for these types of problems. So there's just all sorts of activity going on in this space. In a sense, you could say we recognized it in 2014. We actually created our first um, library product, if you will, that was targeted at this space. And we've, we're on, this is QDNN v1. Two years later, we're on QDNN v5. Okay, that's how fast we are adapting and trying to innovate with the library to enable all of the researchers who are using GPUs to not have to worry about this low-level data organization problem, but be able to use a library that allows them to think about their problem in a very high level. Okay, uh, so there's just a lot going on in this space. And I'm going to suggest that we are basically the engine of deep learning, at least as far as training goes. I'm not going to try and oversell this right now, 
but training is a big part of what deep what makes deep learning interesting and useful it's also a very computationally intensive task and so when you got an engine that can make your training go 10 to 100 times faster you know that takes problems that take weeks and shrinks them to days or days to hours it really dramatically accelerates research um, and all of these companies are uh, we're working with all of them all of these institutions we're working with and their respective technologies to help them use GPUs to make their stuff go faster so um, one of the things that we're witnessing right now so what's happening in NVIDIA right now is that we've sort of come from this HPC space where you have basically uh, if you need to solve big problems you deploy large quantities of servers that have um, sort of a distributed level of technology like two to four Xeon processors per server and you have lots of interconnect and lots of storage and lots of everything else that it takes to make this work and one of the problems that that um, this engenders is that the networking associated with this is is relatively intense in terms of the amount of money that you spend on the networking the amount of complexity that adds to your problem and actually the amount of uh, latency and throughput uh, issues that arise and actually slow your work down and this is particularly true when we try to deploy deep learning uh, type workloads into this sort of traditional HPC or even an enterprise level data center Okay, and, and Google witnesses as well. All of our customers that are deploying GPUs um, in a large scale are witnessing this as well. They're seeing that having a very large distributed infrastructure like this is actually sort of um, counterproductive. And it's not that this was unknown, right? This is certainly a harder way to solve problems, but when you have a really, really big uh, problem to solve, this is kind of the only way that we know how to do it today. And you know, if you look at supercomputing, this is pretty much the top 500 or the top 50 supercomputers are all pretty much organized this way. This is how we solve really big problems. But it's challenging to solve these particular GPU or GPU based training or deep neural network training problems using this approach. Even more challenging than some other HPC workloads. And so what we'd really like to have, and this is kind of, this is always true, right, is we'd like to shrink uh, the performance not the performance, but we like to shrink the, the footprint that this performance requires down to a very small space. This has a number of benefits, but one of the key benefits is we're eliminating a lot of the box-to-box -box traffic, right? If we can take the box-to-box -box traffic and make all of that traffic run within a single processor, or at the most within a single box where we can deploy really high-speed networking to tackle the problem, then this is advantageous and desirable. And it's particularly true when we're, when we're talking about um, the deep learning or the convolutional neural network training workloads that we're dealing with right now. So we'd really like something that's like that on the right. And this is what we're focusing on in NVIDIA right now. We've made a number of uh, um, announcements and introductions at our most recent show, GTC, which I'm gonna talk about some of those. But just to give you an example of what this means for a non-deep learning problem, this is sort of a more traditional workload where we're doing molecular dynamics and we're simulating a particular the behavior of a particular um, biological entity using a kind of a traditional molecular dynamic simulation when you compress the compute capability into a very small space so that you can reduce the the extent to which you require network to do, networking to distribute your problem you can witness really dramatic increases in performance and so this is an example with amber where basically the performance plateaus as we just throw more boxes at it right because as we throw more boxes at the problem, the networking gets to be uh, an issue. It gets to be a problem that really stands, uh, that really opposes our ability, our, our ability to scale the um, hardware to meet the challenge of the problem. This is what we are able to achieve using the same workload, using the same software, solving the same type of molecular dynamic simulation using our most recently introduced products. Just a small number of them, right? This is just four GPUs versus 48 nodes, okay? with all that that implies in terms of memory, storage, networking, et cetera, right? This is just four GPUs in a single box. And we're, not only are we way faster, but we're way smaller in terms of footprint and real estate. Okay, so this is the, this is the dramatic um, observation that we can make, not even with a uh, deep learning type workload. So deep, I just wanna give you a few examples of deep learning type workloads, the kind of stuff that we're seeing today and that we're blogging about. Each one of these slides will have a blog article that you can look at if, uh, if you would like to get more detail or more description. But basically, all three of these I think that I'm going to talk about are really just applying fairly basic image classification 
to problems that we're dealing with or that we'd like to be able to solve today. And so this is an example of researchers who are using uh, deep learning, basically image classification to help detect cancer, right? So cancer, um, one of the ways to detect cancer is to do a biological assay, to look at the actual tissues and use a trained observer to look at those tissues and say, yes, it's cancerous or no, it's not cancerous. Really basic. I mean, I can describe it to you, so it's pretty basic, right? Um, it's really basic in terms of deep learning because it's one of the most basic problems we solve or try to solve, which is image classification. But this is an example of how we can use image classification with a deep neural network to really enhance or assist, assist the throughput of people who are trying to do this work so that they can look at more tissue samples and be more accurate and quickly focus on the ones that are most likely to require their expert attention. Another example, again, basically just an image classification problem, but this is trying to deliver health care out to remote areas. And one of the tools that we have, obviously, is portable devices. And so with a portable device, I can take a picture of your retina. And with, if I have intelligence, in other words, if I have an expert who can look at that retina picture, they can say fairly quickly, yes, this is someone who needs to see uh, a, a, a medical professional, or no, this person doesn't have any obvious issues. And so we can do that now basically with deep learning. So we can basically do a very basic image classification problem with a trained neural network, which we can deploy literally to portable devices anywhere in the world. Um, you can read more about that if you want. This is one of the coolest problems for me because it actually mixes deep learning and a bunch of other um, technologies that are kind of near and dear to our hearts at NVIDIA. So the basic idea here is that the researchers would like to be able to build a biomechanical filter that's structured in such a way that ordinary blood, cell, ordinary blood cells will flow this way through the filter. Okay, so this is literally a mechanical matrix, a very small micro, micro mechanical matrix. And the ordinary blood vessels will flow this way, and somehow based on the shape of these posts, a tumor cell that's floating around in your bloodstream and could be a problem 20 years from now for you, the tumor cell will flow through this filter matrix and because of the shape of these it will tend to bounce its way to the left, okay? Whereas the other blood cells will typically flow this way. So what's going on here is they're using deep learning to help them with the mechanical design of this matrix, the structure of this matrix, so that they selectively move a certain type of cell towards the left and then you can imagine in the filter I've got basically an output here that says this bloodstream is more likely to contain cancer cells than this bloodstream, right? So that's the basic idea. But when you're looking for one in a billion, literally one cell in a billion is tumorous or cancerous I should say, um, it's nearly impossible to do it any other way. We need some technique that will help us to, to scan millions and millions of blood cells at any given time. And so it combines deep learning for the design of the structure and then as they're trying to train the network and improve it, then they simulate it. They do a huge uh, computational fluid dynamics simulation of this. Once they've got a design, they test that and then based on the results, they go back and feed that data back into their deep learning system to improve the system. So this is actually something that requires a huge amount of processing horsepower, both for the deep learning side as well as for the CFD side and this runs on the Titan supercomputer. And so they're gonna build a uh, blood screener based on this using um, deep learning as well as uh, GPU accelerated CFD. So um, when, you tr when you try to tackle problems like that, as we've seen already, you need a lot of horsepower. And it's not as simple as just saying, give me a data center with 5,000 nodes, because as we've seen, um, that doesn't necessarily help. At some point or another, that, the, the, the massive scale of the interconnect and the, other, the massive scale of the other deployment, the, the uh, deployments that you're doing are actually counterproductive. And so we need to create new systems that have really compressed horsepower, if you will, horsepower in a very small space so that we can build uh, essentially the same kind of systems but on a much smaller scale but that can solve bigger problems. And so Tesla P100 is our building block for that. Um, it's a new processor that we just announced at GTC this year, so just a couple months ago. And it combines literally four major new um, advances. This one is software. These three are basically hardware or um, system design, chip design, uh, interconnect design. Um, so there's a lot of different new technologies that we're melding into this processor. Our CEO likes to say that it was five miracles that we had to bet on to make this work. I'm only showing four of them here. Um, 
But by combining all these, and I'm going to talk briefly about each one of these, we've, beat, we've made a processor that you know, basically is far, far and away the fastest thing on the planet fastest thing on the planet for solving these types of workloads. So one of the things that we did was we um, just literally increased the um, compute capability and we did that in a couple different ways. First of all, um, our previous family of processors for double precision workloads, our flagship processor was around 1.4 teraflops peak. Okay, This processor is um, 5 teraflops peak double precision. So right off the bat, even for HPC workloads, it's, you know, it's a very tall animal. It's a very powerful beast. But in addition, we also gave it the ability to do FP16. This is not needed by HPC. This is not needed by graphics. The only scientific workload today that uses FP16 and talks about it in any level of detail is deep learning, okay, is artificial intelligence. Those are the workloads where FP16, in other words, 16-bit floating point computations are interesting. Not because anyone wants reduced resolution, but because we can live with the reduced resolution. And if you give me twice as much compute throughput and twice as much storage density while you're doing that, which is exactly what we deliver, then they'll take that, right? So this is a really interesting new feature. You won't find this in any Intel processor or really any other processor that I know of today, okay? But we've had this out already in TX1, and we've now introduced it in our flagship processor, uh, Pascal P100. So it's a, a huge increase um, in compute performance, okay? Five teraflops double precision, 10 teraflops single precision, 20 teraflops half precision. And what's the sales price? It's, uh, I look forward to it on it's not something, I find it yet. no, you won't find it. And I'll, let me, Come back, ask Sorry. me that question in a slide or two, because I want to answer that question after I get to the next slide, okay, okay. or maybe two slides, okay? Are you orders tonight? Um, I'm not. <laughs> but if you wanted to order, I'll tell you how you can order it tonight. Um, discount for attending. I mentioned also that when we bring all these processors into a single box, it gives us the ability to think about interconnect in a new way, right? We still have a distributed system inside the single box, so we still need high-performance interconnect. But we can now use chip-to-chip -chip level technologies instead of things like InfiniBand or other technologies to give us a really high cross-sectional bandwidth inside the box. So that's what NVLink is all about. Um, we are introducing called, something called Stack Memory, HBM2 Stack Memory. It's introduction for us at NVIDIA. And in order to deliver Stack Memory, this means we're taking the Pascal chip and on the same substrate, we're putting stacks of memory around it. So this is not entirely new for the industry, but it's certainly new for us. And it basically gives us about 3x bandwidth. So I don't know that we've ever done that from one generation of GPUs to the next. I'm not even sure we've ever hit 2x from one generation to the next. In this case, we're going from around 200 to 300 gigabytes per second up to 750 gigabytes per second. So we're literally going 3x in a single GPU generation um, in terms of bandwidth. This is going to be huge uh, because a lot of problems certainly are bandwidth limited. And then we're doing a number of things on the software side to make the Pascal processor even easier to use and more efficient for a variety of workloads. If you want to know more about the software side, I'll be happy to talk to you, but in the interest of time, I want to keep moving. Uh, I lied. Three slides. Give me three slides, and then ask your question again. Um, just a little bit more detail. I mentioned 5, 10, 20, 720 gigabytes. We're also increasing the memory size somewhat today, so we we're going basically from 12 to 16. If you paid attention to what you're doing, you know we're introducing processors today that have 24 gigabytes, but we will have a version of this later that will have 32 gigabytes. So. Pascal is going to be our flagship processor. It'll be um, flagship in every way. Um, NVLink uh, allows us to do basically chip-to-chip -chip interconnect. I'll talk about that in again in just a moment. Um, and I'm going to talk also about DGX1, which is your way to order this processor if you wanted it, wanted to. So what is DGX1? It's another new announcement that we've made, and that is basically um, we are offering a server that packages this technology up for you. So if you're a researcher and you want an easy on-ramp and you want basically a turnkey push-button solution that's software managed by NVIDIA and that we use a push model to deliver updates to so that your level of um, lack of productivity due to system administration is at its lowest possible level, this is the animal for you. Okay, Not to say that You'll be able to get Pascal through all of our partners, right? Dell, HP, IBM, Lenovo, they're all going to be selling it. Um, they all have system plans that they've already disclosed, so you can certainly buy it in a variety of different ways. But this is going to be a very, this will be the earliest possible way to get your hands on Pascal, and it'll be the earliest possible way to get this level of performance in a single box. 
So this is going to have eight of those Pascal processors in it. So eight, just do the math, right? Eight times five, that's 40 teraflops in a single box for double precision. 170 teraflops for half precision. Okay, these are unheard of numbers in a single box. Nobody's ever come close to this in terms of compute throughput. Not even close, not even, we're like orders of magnitude higher than what you would find if you were buying an ordinary server from Intel with Xeon CPUs in it. Um, of course, it does have some Xeon CPUs to run the operating system. There's some storage, um, quad, 100 gigabit, InfiniBand. Okay, so this is intended to be part of a very high performance structure, a very high performance um, array of systems. And it, yes, it uses a lot of power. <laughs> so now you can ask your question. Or let me talk about this, then ask your question, how much does it cost? So this is actually the structure inside the system. These yellow links are NV-Link. This is our chip-to-chip -chip interconnect that we're introducing with this processor. So you can see every chip in a four-way plane connects to every other chip, and then you have up connections that are going in the cube to the other four-way. So it's not a fully interconnected cube. That's why we have this weird hybrid cube mesh name that we've invented to describe this. But nevertheless, you've got each processor has a very high bandwidth connection to adjacent processors, which means that there's, this has many implications. But one of them is, if I'm limited to 16 gig here, but I have a very high bandwidth connection to the 16 gig here, here, and here, as well as the, four, the one above me, that means that realistically I can start to think about problems where one processor is touching 32, 64 gigabytes of data set, right? So now, even though we've only taken a jump from 12 to 16 gigabytes because of our high bandwidth connections, you can now start to think about the fact that I don't need all the data to be local to this processor anymore, okay, with Pascal. And that's one of the key benefits that you would get by packing eight of these into a box, not to mention the compute throughput as well. So let's go back to the question of how do I get one of these? Um, how much do they cost? You can go to our website. We have a landing page for DGX1. Don't quote me on this, but I think it's 129000 for that box. So if you do the math, that pegs the, each of those eight Pascal processors at something like ten grand. i am not saying that we're selling them at ten grand, um, but there's you know easily eighty grand worth of Pascal in there, and then the other forty grand is all the rest of the stuff. Okay, if you if you go out on the market, you're going to find server boxes that start realistically probably somewhere around five grand and go up to forty grand, depending on what you're configuring in there. This has got a lot of stuff in it. Never mind the GPUs. It's got quad InfiniBand, dual ten gig E, two Xeons, lots of memory, lots of rated store SSD storage. So it's not even without the GPUs, it's not a low end budget server. Okay, this is intended to be a powerhouse. But on top of that, we're giving you eight of our Pascal processors. Today, that's really the only way you can get Pascal, is to order one of these. Um, so that's how you would do it. And if you were wondering what I meant about software managed, uh, the 129,000 gets you the box plus a one year warranty. But what we're recommending to our customers is that they also offer the support package because the support package will get you uh, software management by NVIDIA. What this means is that we will take care of the image that's on here and we will take care of pushing new updates to that image. So rather than you having to worry about do I have the latest version of QDNN, your system will offer you the latest version of QDNN in a dockerized container along with whatever framework you're using, okay, assuming NVIDIA is validated on this system. So if you're using any of the software, and we're going to validate it with CAFE, Torch, Theano, and all kinds of TensorFlow, what have you, right? So we'll have Dockerized containers <coughs> that will deliver that complete environment to you, ready to go, validated, basically turnkey push button. That's one of the benefits that you're going to get by getting the support package. It also ups the warranty to three years and does a number of other good things for you in terms of support. So like gets you uh, assigned human support. So. Um, that's extra, of course. Anyway, another interesting way to think about performance is to say, what could I do with one rack? Right? What kinds of problems could I solve with one rack? Or another way to say it is, how many racks of a competing solution would I need to match the performance of this on a particular problem? So if I had one 12 nodes with eight P100s per node, okay, that's a single rack. That's a, you know 38 kilowatts is probably at the high end of what people would like to put in their racks in terms of populating data centers. Um, but with that single rack of 8 P100s per node, 12 nodes in a rack, let's run some workloads. 
these are workloads that we don't do particularly well at, okay? People are using GPUs to accelerate these workloads, but they're not our most awesome workloads. So there it would take you only 638 or 650 CPUs and a lot more electrical power in order to match the performance of this thing, right? But now let's talk about some of the workloads that we do really well at, okay? If you wanted to match the deep learning training performance in this node or this rack, you would require just a ridiculous number of only CPU driven racks in order to reach that level of performance. And a lot of the difference here, some of the difference here is just the fact that the GPU is well suited to it, but let's not forget the fact that some of the difference here, the ridiculous difference here, is due to the fact that when you shrink all of your processing down to a fairly small number of systems and you reduce the number of network hops that you need to tie those systems together, or you replace InfiniBand links with chip-to-chip -chip interconnected links, you actually develop a much more powerful and efficient system even for the larger workloads. Okay, so um, I've talked about performance already and I sense that I'm like way over time. Yes, I'm way over time. So uh, I just want to point out that we do a lot on the software side as well. I'm going to try and demo div digits here in just a few minutes um, so you get to see what that is. That's basically a graphical front end that you can put on top of various frameworks and allows you to have sort of an easy on-ramp a relatively easy way to interact with it. I'll demo that. Um, QDNN is our library to make all this stuff work. So digits is like up here. Stuff in the middle would be like CAFE, Torch, Theano, uh, TensorFlow, CNTK, what have you. And most of those will be using QDNN before they talk to the GPU. Down here is the GPU doing the work, but they'll all, almost all of them will be interfacing through, the, through this QDNN library to actually use the GPU. If you're doing other kinds of work, you might be interested in our sparse matrix library, our dense matrix library, if neural networks is not your thing, but you're doing some other kind of um, related activity. And we've just introduced another new library called Nickel, which will help you do various kinds of scatter, gather, and re all reduce type operations through a collection of GPUs. So these would be sort of, in a sense, lower level libraries that would give you building blocks if sort of the traditional um, <coughs> convolutional neural network or deep neural network approach and its associated data, or data organization doesn't work for your type of research. Plus we have GPUs, we have also something called a dev box, which has been going for a while now. This is basically a desk side workstation that has lots of GPU horsepower in it. And then you can also access uh, GPU resources in the cloud, okay, through a number of different approaches. And if that isn't the right size for you and you're interested in deploying something in a mobile or remote fashion or a, uh, you know, a, a, a vehicular fashion, let's say, or an autonomous vehicle type fashion, um, we have systems on a chip processors that have basically the same compute architecture. So you program them the same way. They, run, they can run arguably the same software. You use CUDA or what have you to program it just like you would our big GPUs but this is now something that runs in the range of milliwatts to watts as opposed to hundreds of watts and it's got integrated ARM cores and a range of I.O. just like you'd expect with a, an SOC processor. Last, I just want to put a plug in for this. If you're, um, if you're in this area of um, deep learning, especially with DNNs, um, and you're interested in testing out your skills, this is something that you might be interested in. IBM is trying to um, increase uh, awareness of the Open Power platform, and we've certainly got a lot going on with them. So this whole thing that I was talking about with NVLink has a very significant connection to Open Power processors that will be coming down the road later this year. Um, and so they're interested in developing a lot of um, or inspiring a lot of interest in this platform that they're working on. And if you're interested in that, you should take a look at this. It's basically hosted here. So if you go to openpower.devpost.com, you'll find a landing page where there's discussion forums, instructions for how to get involved. If you want to take any of these challenges, um, they are providing a cloud-based resource. So you don't have to have your own GPU resource, which probably most of you don't have if you're uh, in terms of having an open power GPU-based resource. That's still a pretty new entity right now in the market. So this gives you access to open power G GPU resources that would allow you to um, complete your work for the challenge and you can win uh, prizes. So with that, I'm done with my presentation. And what I'd like to do, if you would like to sit around for another 10 or 15 minutes, is demo uh, digits. So digits, as I mentioned, is a, um, 
a graphical front end, if you will, for a, uh, a number of frameworks. I'll be demonstrating it running on top of CAFE. And I'm actually going to demonstrate it using an Amazon cloud-based resource. So this is um, a portal, nvlabs.quicklabs.com or, or nvidia.quicklab.com is probably what you would go to. But this is basically a portal where we offer both free and paid self-guided classes. And what this means is that you can um, go to this portal, sign up, and you can take a number of free classes where you basically get to spin up your own Amazon instance that has a GPU in it. So in the Amazon EC2 system, there's a number of machine types that have GPUs in them, and you get to have one of those for your personal use while you're taking the class. And you're given basically an IPython notebook that has a mixture of instructional material as well as code samples that you can work on, exercises that you can do. I'm actually going to use that resource. If, if you'd like more information about that or GPU programming training in general, come see me after. But I'm actually going to use this to run digits. So I'm going to run digits um, in the cloud running on an Amazon EC2 instance. So once I've already spun up this instance, it's waiting for me, so all I have to do is launch it that way. And Digits is basically a web-based front end, so that means that even though this computer is out in the cloud somewhere, I can interact, it, interact directly with Digits running on that computer simply with a web browser. Okay? I don't need to have anything installed on my local machine in order to do any of the types of things that I'm about to demo. So the basic idea behind Digits, and if you're an advanced researcher, you're going to find this to be relatively um, basic. Uh, so it, Certainly the capabilities are limited. To some extent, it's limited by the framework that it's running on. But Digits is really intended to be a fairly simple on-ramp, not necessarily for a deep, learn, deep learning researcher who really knows the ins and outs of CAFE. You'll probably find Digits to be cumbersome. It gets in your way, perhaps. Okay, But if you are working in a um, biology lab and you've heard about deep learning or deep neural networks and you'd like to say I think I might have an image classification problem I have a data set what would it be like could I train it what kind of results would I get this might be a very uh, uh, easy way for let's say a relatively unsophisticated and I don't mean that negative I just mean in terms of deep learning right there's lots of people who want to do real science and they don't want to learn how to program GPUs or any number of other things that are related to it right they want to solve their problem so this can be a fairly easy on-ramp to solving problems, uh, but again, it's, it, it could be cumbersome if you're a, a cafe expert, for example. But uh, ba the basic idea is we are going to um, train and test a neural network. So the first thing that I need in this new programming model is a data set. So we're going to define a data set, and I've already got some data sets available to me, so I'm going to create a new image data set for classification. Um, it's asking me for a username, that's okay. And what I get to do is define the type of data that I'm working with in the upper left hand corner and then I can actually pick a set of training images that correspond to that definition. So I'm going to choose, uh, the, the data set that I want to use is the MNIST data set, which is, um, if you're familiar with this, this is basically a, a set, a training data set of 0 through 9, the digits, handwritten digits 0 through 9. And if I'm not mistaken, it's used by the Postal Service and probably lots of other people to do very basic handwriting recognition of digits. Okay, um, So this is a, a, a well-known data set, MNIST, and it has uh, the classes are 0 through 9, or the categories of the data are handwritten images uh, in the range from 0 through 9. So that's where, it's, where it happens to be stored on this server that I'm working on. And that particular data set is a grayscale data set and these are small images, so we're talking about 32 by 32. So I'm going to change that. So now I've defined my data set, and I've actually, I, I defined the type of image that I'm working with, and I'm also defining where this actual data set is located. And uh, if you're familiar with CAFE, CAFE breaks different classes of images basically into different folders, or that's one of the ways to store a data set on your machine. And each folder name then becomes a, cl a category of images. So I have a folder called zero, which is all the handwritten zeros, a folder called one, which is all the handwritten ones. If I wanted to see that, um, let's see, where can I do that? Let's give this a name. I think this is 28 by 28. It is, it is, but um, so that the 
the network that we're going to use is 28 by 28 organized, but the actual image is 32 by 32 because the, um, if I'm understanding it correctly, the network needs a uh, the network doesn't need a border, but in order to apply the convolution to the data layer, we need a border of, of images so that when I do a let's say a four by four convolution at the very edge of a 28 by 28 image, I still have data out here. Right, so we're actually feeding a 32 by 32 data, but the network is organized to be 28 by 28. Whoever said that, you're absolutely correct. Um, and we're actually classifying based on 20, the 28 by 28 center of the 32 by 32 image. Um, so let's give this data set a name. <clears throat> and once I do this, it is going to um, do some initial processing for me. This isn't training the network or anything like this. This is just taking the data set and getting it organized so that it's understandable to CAFE. And one of the things that I have done is asked it to create both a training data set and a validation data set. So this, it'll do this automatically for you. It'll, if you want to, it'll take your data set and provide, break it into two pieces, one of which you use for training and then a separate set that you haven't trained on for validation. This should only take a minute or two um, to get this done. And so once we've got this created then, we can go ahead and define the model that we want to use and actually train the model and then test the result, test that model to see if it gives me interesting results. So right off the bat I can see that I've created two data sets if you will. This is a training data set, this is a validation data set, and I can see how many images in each category. I asked for 25%, so this number here should be about 25% of whatever's there, um, roughly speaking. So um, these are the number of images I have in each category that I'm going to use for validation. That's to prove that I'm getting a useful result out of my network. And these are the ones that I'm actually going to train on. So we're almost done there. What if I wanted to actually see it? Um, there's a number of different ways I could do this. I don't have to do this within digits, but I could explore the data set. So this is just showing me all the examples that are in the data set. If I wanted to filter by a particular class, let's say I wanted to look at a bunch of images in my, this is my validation data set that are associated with four. In other words, they were chosen out of the folder that was named four. These are all handwritten fours that came out of that folder that'll be used for validation of my data set. So this is just a quick way to validate or to look at the created data set that um, was created for you. Okay, so now it is done. My data set, my MNIST, this is the one I just created, MNIST 1 T1 is done. Um, I could delete it if I want. But basically I've now created the data set that I'm going to use for training. So now I want to go over here and select an appropriate model. A model is basically kind of like saying a, a network model. In other words, what sort of um, neural network structure am I going to use to train so that I can recognize these images. So this is the input uh, area for choosing a model and we can work with both CAFE and TORCH right now. So I'm going to work with CAFE. Here's a, num a number of standard models that I can work with. So right now I've chosen Lynette which is a fairly simple 28 by 28 at least for its input layer 28 by 28 model. Um, you can read the original paper. If I had a more complicated data set, like if I was using color or larger images, I might want to use one of these larger models for starting. I can also customize an existing model, or I can start with a custom network. So when I customize an existing model or start with a custom network, basically now, in this case, since I've chosen CAFE, I have to be knowledgeable about CAFE prototext because the CAFE prototext is what's used to define the network model. So I'm not going to try and teach you CAFE prototypes, partly because I couldn't do that. But one of the cool features that we've got here is that you can actually visualize the model. So let's say I went into that prototypes, which was a, like a roughly a six or eight layer model, something like that. Um, and I wanted to add something to it, add another layer to do to whatever, a fully connected layer or a convolutional layer or whatever. Then when I'm done, I want to make sure that I did it right. Well, there's a, visualiz a visualization tool which will show you basically the network structure in a flowchart form and, and you'll be able to observe the types of connections and the types of layers that you've got. So from an input standpoint, this, that's what data is happening at the top here. Um, my first layer, main layer that I'm running into is a convolutional layer, then a hit, a pooling layer. And so you can sort of uh, quickly visualize how this particular Lynette model is organized. There's a second convolutional layer, a second pooling layer. 
IP is inner product, which is basically a fully connected layer. So these, these are going to be smaller numbers of neurons. And ultimately, we generate uh, results for accuracy, which is tested against the validation data set, and loss, which is a measurement of the training activity or the, the, the how good the training itself is working. Okay? So, what else do we need to specify? Um, I need to pick a data set, so I created my MNIST T1 that, so I'm going to choose that data set. This is a new feature, I think, in, in digits 2 or 3. Um, where you can specify a Python layer file. So a Python layer, the basic idea is you've got neural networks which are organized in layers that are feeding their data to the next layer. Let's say that you had some weird transformation that you want to do the data that was hard to, rec hard to realize with just a layer of neurons, right? Well, I can actually stick a Python layer in there which simply takes the input, allows you to run some arbitrary Python uh, processing on it, and then passes the output of that to the next layer. Okay, so this is kind of a cool new feature. This isn't really uh, something amazing that Digit's done. This is building on a feature that's exposed in CAFE. That's how we're doing that. Um, is that just restricted to Python? If you want something to run really fast, do you have an option for C or similar? I think it's just restricted to Python, but there's, I don't believe that there's any reason that you couldn't... Um, someone might correct me if I'm wrong here. But I don't believe there's any reason that you couldn't from within Python link to C if you had because like you still have a little extra overhead. Yeah, it's extra work to do, right? Well not, not an extra unless it's programming, but there's still gonna be a ex little extra uh, overhead in the pro in the actual execution. Sure, but presumably the reason you're doing that is because the C execution is running much, much faster yeah, than the Python it's, execution. It'd be nice to be able to eliminate that. Well hang on, in the GPU isn't the GPU running CUDA and whatever's on the Python is in the CPU and then it goes into the GPU it's the GPU native mode or something? That's correct. So what actually runs here is going to be a function of what you write in your Python layer. And it might not use the GPU at all. Yeah. Okay. So whether it uses the GPU or not is going to be a function of what's actually in this code in this Python layer that you have to feed into the system. You have to define that. So you have to use like PyCuda if you want to go. If you wanted to take advantage of the GPU, one of the approaches would be PyCuda. Or um, there's other Python uh, enabled uh, access methods like Numba, Numba Pro, things like that. Okay, so there's several different ways to skin the cat from within Python. But I'm not an expert on Python layers in Cafe, so I, I haven't actually done this. But the point is, whatever you specify here in Python is what it's going to run to process it. And if you just write ordinary Python, just like you would in any setting, it's not going to run on the GPU unless you use PyCuda or some other approach to tap into the GPU from Python. Okay. The point of this is not that this is a high performance method, right, but this is to enable research, right? Once you've figured out that you've got the, the, the transformation that you want in your Python layer, then you can look for ways to accelerate that, perhaps by realizing it in, you know, a network layer or a set of network layers. Um, anyway, so app box in training means how many times do I go through the training set? So we saw we had thousands of images. 30 app box means I'm going to go through all of those images 30 times, and that... 30 times, meaning I'm going to perform the back propagation on each image in the data set 30 times for all of the thousands and thousands of images in this data set. Okay? A snapshot interval is how often do I take a snapshot of the network so I can do something with it? In other words, effectively save away the weights that I've trained. So I'm now snapshotting the weights every epoch. So I, have, I can look at this network from the standpoint of any training epoch and see where it was at. I can literally test it if I want to. Um, the validation interval is how often do I run the validation, which is basically just to produce a score or a number. Um, there's some other data there that I can specify. For instance, learning rate um, is something that people care about. And so we have kind of some, a standard learning rate and a standard learning rate model down here on the bottom. But I can change that. So I can change the base learning rate. I can also change the way the learning rate is modified as training goes on. So this has got a so-called step-down model. If you want to see what that looks like graphically, it means that for this particular network model, the learning rate will start out at its default value, and after some number, after 33% of the training, so after 10 epochs, it'll drop down to a much lower value, and after another 10 epochs, it'll drop down to an extremely low value. So the learning rate is decreasing over time, which is a fairly common strategy when you're training neural networks. The learning rate basically is how quickly does the network change based on a particular back propagation um, event or iter iteration. So if I back propagation in a nutshell says uh, 
I want this network to say it's a one because that's what I'm presenting to it, right? And so the one neuron should be firing, but I've got all the other neurons zero through nine and they're all at some value. What I'd really like is one to be at maximal value and the zero through nine, all the other ones to be at some low level, right? But that's not where they're at during training, they're at other levels. And so the difference between those two vector states is effectively the error that's fed back into the network through the back propagation process. The learning rate says that as I'm going through the network and back propagation and I'm adjusting the weights as a result of that error, how much of an adjustment, it's kind of like a multiplicative factor, if you will, how much of an adjustment do I make to the network weights for that particular iteration? So initially we're moving the network weights a lot. In other words, we're, we're causing the network to significantly change. But once you start to converge, if you will, and I'm using that word loosely, once you start to converge on a trained model, then you, ge you generally don't want the network to take big excursions. You want additional training inputs to make smaller and smaller incremental changes as you go. And so that's the reason that you would typically see something like that. All right, so I believe I have entered all the data necessary in order to train this model. Everything looks good up there. I just have to give it a name. And once I click create, I've basically established the parameters of this network and it's gonna literally go off and start training it. Um, it's gonna give me some GPU utilization information as it's going, so initially we're just getting started. The GPU is just gonna get started to be utilized. The memory utilization is going up here. Um, but once this stretch gets into the training in another 10 or 20 seconds, we'll start to see some data presented out here which gives you a real-time status, if you will, of the training activity. So the training occurs basically epoch by epoch. So this is now the results of the first epoch, okay? This is epoch on the bottom. Um, blue is our loss function. That's basically a measurement of the error that occurs during the training process. Um, green is the validation loss. That's the same error measurement against the validation set instead of the training set. And then yellow is the, what do they call it, error, I think? But yellow is basically how close is that network on average predicting the correct um, answer. So you can see this network very quickly in one or two epochs jumps up to a very high error rate. So we didn't really need to train this for 30 iterations, but it won't take that long because I've chosen such a small data set and a very small model to train on. Um, accuracy, that's what I was, accuracy is a measurement of how the network would behave in the real world. In other words, against the validation set, how often does it predict the correct answer? Um, you can see here now we're also showing you the learning rate. So you can see the learning rate has now stepped down after 10 epochs, just like we expected it to. If, I, if this were going on for a long time, this is, this is all going to happen in a few minutes. But in the real world, the networks you're training are bigger, the data sets are, you're training are, big, are bigger, and you're training them for longer and longer periods of time. So one of the things that this is going to do for you as a researcher is give you some intermediate feedback as to is this thing headed in the right direction or should I kill this, not wait four hours for this thing to train and see if I did something wrong or perhaps make some changes, right? So this is going to start to give you some real-time feedback as to what's going on. And in addition, I can pick off a set of weights from a particular uh, epoch. In other words, basically this is the trained, ep the trained network after epoch 20 and I can actually apply an image and have it test, I can test against an image that it has never seen before. So let me see if I can do that. Um, I'm just about done. Uh, let me see. Cool. So this is just an image that I'm telling you to go grab off the internet, okay? This is just a URL, okay? And we'll see what that looks like. I think it's in the, digit 9, but this is just the digit that I'm pulling off of the internet, and I can say classify this one image, and it will immediately take the whatever current epoch that I've selected, and this is, it'll show you what the image was that it pulled off the internet, and it's saying with 100% probability, these actually aren't 100%, but it's rounding to six places or something, and that gives us 100% and zero against the next most likely candidates for this. Another cool feature is, if you're a researcher, don't ask me to explain all this, but um, another cool feature is if I want to see a little bit more detail about what the network is doing with that, I can ask for that as well. And in addition to just a prediction, it'll give me, these are basically uh, an activation. So that means that when I presented this data to the layer, the data layer is just the input layer, so there's really no change. I get to see what the data looks like. But after 
Let me go down to a convolutional layer. In the first convolutional layer, when I apply this data to it, these are the activations for each of the little convolution functions that are colored according to the, uh, the output of that particular neuron, right? So if the output is strongly on, I think it's red, and if it's strongly off, I think it's blue, and the other colors are in between. So you can sort of see visually how does this particular image excite this particular convolutional area within this particular layer. Um, it's honestly a little bit beyond me, but as a researcher, apparently this kinds of, these kinds of things are interesting and important. And we're also giving you some other statistics about what's going on at that layer as well. So with that, I'm basically done with digits. If there's questions, I'll try and answer it. Um, but hopefully that was something that would be interesting to you if, like I said, you were perhaps not the most sophisticated researcher or if you were working in an area of domain science like biology or chemistry and you wanted to use neural networks as a, as a tool in that domain. Yes? So um, my research lab actually has a couple of vent boxes. Uh -huh. I was wondering, as a researcher, how efficient the parallelization is for, say, you know, we got four GPUs per vent box, and how is Digits like smart enough to parallelize the workload? Yes. Um, in in Digits V2, you can specify multiple GPUs to be used for a training job. Um, but the other, so. Um, I'm going to leave that to you to go and research that, but it's, it's, it's in the user interface. I can literally pick the GPU. In this particular Amazon instance, I only have one GPU, so there's no selection that I can do here. But um, if you look at the um, Digits V2 user interface and you have four GPUs in the machine, you'll, you'll find a selection box where you can pick which GPUs you want to use for that particular training task. But with a dev box, and one of the things that we like to talk about with the dev box is that we like to position it as a sort of convenient on-ramp for a work group, right? And uh, what this means is you can literally plop the box down somewhere. Everyone's accessing it through the web, so it doesn't matter where they are or where the dev box is. And if you have four GPUs, it means, in addition, if you wanted to make your training run faster, that's one way that you could use multiple GPUs. But another way is give, that's now four researchers that can be actively doing training work, right? So with this one dev box, I can you know, potentially enable a work group that way. So that's, there's a number of different ways that you could use multiple GPUs. And when we introduced, if I'm not mistaken, when we introduced Digits DevBox, Digits did not have the multi-GPU capability. So that was really the only thing that we talked about in terms of multi-GPU. But now with Digits V2, I think, or maybe it's V3, but I think it was V2, we introduced multi <coughs> Uh, training and there's actually a write-up on digits in our parallel for all blog. So if you go to our, if you just search uh, NVIDIA digits parallel for all, you'll find an article that was written one of, by one of our solution architects named Allison Gray, and she talks about all the capabilities and new features in digits, and one of them is the multi GPU stuff. How much does the dev box cost? The dev box is, it, don't quote me on it, but I think it's around fifteen thousand, and for that you get. Um, four Titan X1 or Titan X's, um, and you get the server, or not the server, the workstation. So that's a, <coughs> can't remember if it's a single Xeon or dual Xeon. I think it's a dual Xeon workstation. Um, but it has, and it has, I think, three terabytes of RAID, but it's not SSD, if I'm not mistaken. So it's definitely a lot more. If I can use the word ordinary, then DGX1, right? DGX1 is, is, is for us, conceptually a similar animal in that we wanted to enable people to take advantage of this technology, especially with easy on-ramp, turnkey, push-button type thinking, okay? But DGX1 is, you know, way beyond Digit's DevBox. So Digit's DevBox is, is kind of um, old technology. <laughs> now that we've introduced DGX1. But the Digit Step Box is still certainly available and it has uh, certainly a lot of horsepower for people who are exploring this stuff. Yes? I was interested if you said uh, the DGX1, uh, so it's a Dockerized environment for the previous stuff? Yep. Um, so and frameworks and other software that you would want to use, yes. So, so I was interested with that. There was an uh, announcement a few months ago from the video uh, working with Mesos. Uh -huh. um, so being able to have a, a Dockerized environment for, uh, for that across the data center. Yep. So does the DJX1, is that intended to maybe work with Mesos? Yes. Okay. But you would not have to use Mesos if you did not want to. We're going to have uh, Docker images 
that wouldn't necessarily depend on masons. But yes, it's designed to work with masons as well. Great. Yes. Uh, okay, so we use um, Apache Spark for text analytics, and uh -huh. it gets tremendous benefits by parallelizing across multiple cores. And but we run into network bandwidth issues. So, are there any plans to work with those folks in terms of parallelizing on the same machine through GPU cores and making that somewhat seamless? Um, yes, I'm not a Spark expert, but we are working. Um, with the Spark community. And one of the things that we're doing, one of the ways that we at NVIDIA enable a community, if we're really serious about it, is we create a library, right? In other words, we want to make it as easy as possible for you to do deep learning, so we create QDNN. We want to make it as easy as possible, this is a long time ago, for you to do linear algebra, so we create Kublas, right? Um, we have just introduced with CUDA 8, this is another new uh, announcement at GTC, a new library called NVGraph, I think it's called. And it's specifically designed at graph analytics, and we would expect that um, people who are doing any kind of data-centric analytic work would be interested in that library. I couldn't tell you what are all the um, APIs and functions in that library, but it should enable workloads. It's going to be at a lower level than Spark, okay? But what we would expect is from a from a infrastructure or a middleware standpoint that you would have basically an environment where you've got Spark here and you've got um, NVGraph here and then you're running your little Spark workload, right? And it's interacting directly with NVGraph to get GPU acceleration so, so within Spark. So the directed acyclical graphs that Spark is using would leverage those libraries. Right, exactly, yes. Okay. But I, I'm not an expert on it, and I don't know that I could go much farther description than that. So, um, but yeah, we have lots of people that are working on Spark, um, and we have lots of people who are interested in Spark. Seems like the two together, right? Really and in particular, um, Spark is probably better suited to GPUs than Hadoop is or was, right? So Hadoop um, is another parallelization strategy, and it sort of has a certain level of granularity or coarseness to it. And what people found with Hadoop was that many of the problems they were trying to solve with Hadoop, um, the GPU didn't add much benefit, partly because the, the, the quantity of work that you would typically assign to a Hadoop uh, reduce operation was not enough to be that interesting on the GPU. But with Spark, people are sort of amping up the, the amount of work that they're doing per um, reduction or per reduce operation. Or, uh, that's not the right terminology in Spark, but per element if you will. And well, it comes with its own ML lib and uh, right, libraries right, anyway. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. so just that. like we are, we saw with deep learning, where we introduced QDNN and immediately, not immediately, but almost immediately, CAFE and then Torch and then Theano and then TensorFlow comes out and it's just using QDNN, right? So our hope is that by introducing a library called NVGraph and then working with people who are building that middleware, those libraries for Spark that that will be the connection because that's an easier on ramp for you than you have to learn GPU programming, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Could see this right. That's the idea. AWS instance that runs on top of it. Yep. Yes. Um, can you share some um, examples and protection or um, libraries for um, inferences like MCMC sampling or message passing? For inference, I'm not. You're going to have to uh, tease it out for me a little better. What exactly? So for, for Monte Carlo sampling, uh -huh. to, to find uh, to do inference on patient networks. So. Okay. Um, I don't know if this is a great answer, but we have. You know, one of the things that's going to drive one of the compute-intensive tasks for Monte Carlo is just the random number generation, right? And so we have a library that runs on GPUs that does random number generation, high quality random sequences that are, you know, have scientific papers that are backing them up, like, um, uh, well, I can't think of any of the random algorithms right now, but if it'll come to me if I think about it long enough. Um, so that's one of the ways that we would enable that. But beyond that, in terms of just having a framework that supports Monte Carlo type operations, I don't know that there's anything specific that I can point to, but there's lots of people who use Monte Carlo approaches to solving a lot of different problems. And, they, and certainly those are generally well suited for the GPU because um, the GPU likes to have massively parallel problems, right? And it likes to have problems that are relatively independent. And that's usually what you have when you're doing a Monte Carlo-based simulation, right? You have a bunch of trials, in a sense. And each one of those trials is independent. 
So, um, you know, the, the input, the start of the process is to generate your relatively high quality random numbers and then you run your trial workload. And that trial workload is usually highly independent from other trials. So GPUs tend to be pretty good at Monte Carlo simulation, but beyond that, I don't know if there's anything I can say specifically. Yes? <clears throat> when can we get your Cadillac processor on uh, Amazon Cloud? AWS. Talk to Amazon. They're in here, right? I hope they haven't left yet. <laughs> um, that's, you know, I shouldn't speak for Amazon, but um, I believe that the way to get Amazon interested in putting new hardware resources in their cloud is by uh, somehow indicating to them to that there's business there. I mean, they're profit motive just like we are. And uh, so the somehow we, we as a community need to present those workloads to them and demonstrate that the GPU instance types that they have right now are inadequate. And if I would, do, you know, not trying to be negative here, but I would suggest that they're inadequate. So although the cloud, the Amazon cloud is an interesting place to do GPU work because, or to do uh, deep learning type work because there's GPUs available, those GPUs today are not the Cadillacs. Um, so if you're interested in Cadillac level horsepower, um, I guess I would suggest, and you're looking for a relatively easy on-ramp, you know, I'd probably suggest DevBox or maybe DGX1, or um, there are some other cloud providers that have uh, newer hardware. So if we leave Pascal out of it for the moment, because there are no cloud providers with Pascal at the moment, um, there are certainly cloud providers that have newer GPUs than what's available in the Amazon cloud. And in particular, there are cloud providers that are going to provide K80 and M40, which are Tesla, pro Tesla processors that are pretty good. I mean, they were the best that we had to offer for deep learning type workloads. Uh, so you can certainly find, you know, re the last generation of the flagship processor in the cloud. You just don't find it at Amazon. So I guess once Amazon decides that there's enough critical mass or they see enough business going to wherever, then that might be the impetus or the trigger. I can't speak in detail about what our relationship is with Amazon or or, um, or uh, what plans they may have. They may very well have plans to up their GPU ante for all I know. I was involved with Amazon like five years ago. So in the, the original Amazon uh, GPU instance was a, a G1. G1.4x large instance, and I was on the technical side supporting Amazon as they were getting all of their bits and pieces and virtual machine uh, structure set up for to use those GPUs. But after they got G1.4x large, then I went off and did other stuff, and somebody else supported them for the current round, which is the G2.2x large and G2.8x large, if I'm not mistaken. Those are the two machine types that are available right now. And the G2.2x large is what I just used. That's a single, basically a single, I think, eight core processor with a single uh, Kepler processor that's interesting but not awesome, okay? Uh, and then the G2.8x large is a similar machine type. I think it has two or four uh, CPUs, plus it has four of those same GPUs. So if you, you have four in a single box, which is more interesting but still not quite awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, I, there's a whole ton of things I'd like to ask you, but just on the digits one, it looked like the GPU was being used just from the, you know, the little stuff that was coming out. Yeah, I didn't spend much time, but there is a know, status thing that was telling you. The thing is, usually with, my, my, I mean, I haven't done, done much with GPUs, but typically what I find is that for small arrays, the GPU slows you down. You only win with the GPU when you're looking at gigantic data sets, which this is not. So, well, um, and this was really pretty speedy, too. So. And I mean, this takes this this task takes like a few minutes on my like on my PC, okay, which is obviously not an eight core server, but um, you know it gives you relatively crappy results. Like it's like you know several percent error after a few minutes, or I forget something like that. But anyway, um, you mean without a GPU? Is that what you're getting? Yeah. At? yeah. Well, I mean, but I don't see how the GPU would, would speed this up at all. Well. It's a really small array, so you don't get the benefits of parallelization hardly. The only reason, this is a relatively uninteresting problem. No, of course it is. Which it's is what, toy. right. And the reason that I chose this is because we get the work done in a few minutes so that I can demonstrate yeah, yeah, it in, yeah. in the scope of a demonstration where you yeah. get to see the whole process. Right. But, you know, that nobody is, to your point, nobody is going to take 
a GPU to solve a problem that takes minutes to solve, at least not in the deep learning space. You're going to use a GPU when you have problems that take days or weeks or longer to solve, right? So, and there's plenty of, um, like, uh, let's go back to the model page. This Lynette network is a very small network, okay? So the amount of computational intensity associated with that is really small, along with all the other facets of the problem that you pointed out. But there's certainly bigger networks that you can run through this, and if your network is big enough, it's gonna take a long time to train, right? Even with whatever data set that you care to throw at it. So um, I think uh, you're absolutely right. No one would use this for doing anything interesting GPU acceleration-wise, but as soon as you go to uh, more, let's say, realistic problems, I think that the value of the GPU is going to become evident because um, there's something like a, around, even with this generation of technology, there's something around a 4 to 8x reduction in training time for large problems if you're, versus just the CPU. And this is, again, not our latest technology anymore. Yes? So, oh, if we have more questions for Bob, we can take one more, but you can just come afterwards. We have this room for a little while. But yeah, otherwise, we also have these books from O'Reilly, which you can come pick up um, just from the back over there. But yeah, we can take All right, I saw two hands, so let's yeah. do two more, and then we'll oh, okay. let everyone leave. Which are the cloud providers that have the K20s? Um, SoftLayer has K80s. Microsoft, Azure, if they don't have it today, in the near future, like in the next couple of months, will have both M40 and K80. M40, apart from the new Pascal stuff, M40 would have been our flagship processor for deep learning training, okay? But K80 is still really good. Like, the difference between M40 and K80 is relatively small. Uh, but, okay. So do you have uh, some sort of uh Yes, we have um, a number of different monitoring levels that we support depending on what your level of infrastructure is. So one of the ways that you would be able to just trivially look at what a GPU is doing is we give you command line tools. So there's a tool called NVIDIA SMI. It'll just give you a snapshot of what are all the GPUs in their system, what are the processes associated with them, how much memory are they using, how much of the compute resource are they using, et cetera. Um, we also have a uh, API uh, software library that would typically be used by someone who's developing an interface to Ganglia or some other monitoring utility um, that would allow them to pull similar types of information into that utility for visualization or recording or what have you. And that can be done on whatever time basis you want. So you can develop a, you know, a time-based utilization of memory usage, for example, and then you can delineate this process was here, this process was here, et cetera. Um, we have a new version of our monitoring framework that we're releasing called DCGM which is sort of like what we've had previously on steroids. And if you want to learn more about that, if you just Google DCGM, like NVIDIA DCGM, you'll go to our landing page and it'll explain to you what we're doing, what's the latest stuff that we're doing with monitoring. So that means we can do, uh, with DCGM, you can now do historical monitoring. So you can flip a switch that says, remember what happened for the last day, eight hours, what have you, and then give it to me when I ask for it, for, as an example. So that's just one example of what's new in the DCGM, which is new. And you mentioned PyCuda. Um, if you're, say, you're just working in Python, and you have some custom network architecture that doesn't map well on something like that. I started from PyCuda. Is there anything I want to look at as an interface for the GPUs? Uh, both Numba and Numba Pro can take advantage of the GPU. And there may be other Python approaches as well. For example, NVIDIA has a library called Copperhead. But I wouldn't, I mean, Copperhead is a Python connection to the GPU, but I wouldn't suggest you start there. But Numba and Numba Pro are both fairly widely used technologies. So if you Google those, they're from Continuum I.O., I believe. Oh. And um, so I think Numba is free and Numba Pro is a paid thing. Yeah. And um, with PyCuda, the basic idea is you can either interface to a library like KuBloss, KuSparse, KuDNN, or whatever, 
Or you can write your own CUDA C or C++ code and then call it, if you will, from Python. It's kind of, I'm being a little bit generic here. With Numba, you have the ability to use their libraries, right? So they have libraries you can do things like matrix multiply, and Numba will take care of that for you, or what have you. Oh, cool. How do you, uh, how's that spelled? N-U-M-B-A. And Numba Pro is just that with a dash pro. So if you just Google Numba, Numba Pro, or Numba GPU, or Numba Pro GPU, you'll get more information about it. Thanks so much to Bob for flying out. Thanks all.